uh, moving on to our practitioners, to other renowned practitioners in the field of dispute resolution. They don't need any introduction. We have Shashank Gadd, who is a renowned arbitration practitioner. Uh, we've seen him in many forums, uh, pioneering several activities, uh, promotion of international arbitration through various means. We also have Samit Jain, who heads the tier one arbitration practice, PSL, uh, renowned name uh, in the field of dispute resolution and litigation. Uh, you know, my questions to both of y'all are going to be on the practitioner's perspective. We have a lot of practitioners here and I, I want you to speak uh, your perspective, which, are, which I'm sure gels with their perspective. And I'm going to divide your themes into two or three practice areas so we are able to cover good ground. Uh, Shashank, I think you are going to be dealing with infrastructure. And why I bring this topic out is because we have a lot of attendees coming from the infrastructure industry. Uh, and as you know, the biggest dispute market or unresolved dispute market in India today is infrastructure. COVID has not helped the cause. It's only gotten worse. The number of claims against state-owned enterprises has only increased. Uh, how do you see litigation finance coming and solving this conundrum, you know, the infrastructure claim conundrum? Uh, thank you so much, Prateek. Before I answer that question, I must also congratulate the entire working group and all the stakeholders for putting this uh, group together and uh, trying to bring the best practices in the field of litigation finance to India. Uh, coming back to the question that you have put, before we understand the significance of litigation finance for the infrastructure sector, we should also look at what the statistics say. Where are we uh, when we talk about India in terms of infrastructure and development? Now, government of India has allocated $1.4 trillion for the, from 2019 to 25 only for the infrastructure uh, sector. Also, if you have to believe the stats released by government of India, by 2022, India is supposed to become the third largest economy in the construction sector. So uh, let's assume uh, COVID has taken a year out of that. So 2023 or 2024, but uh, that, that's a very, very promising uh, number. You know, if we are likely to become the third largest economy in the infrastructure and construction sector in next two to three years, then it is it is a matter of not only pride for us as practitioners and stakeholders, but also a matter of great interest for uh, litigation funders to take India as a very, very serious market. Uh, interestingly, I'm sure practitioners and stakeholders are aware this 100% FDI is permitted under the automatic route for infrastructure sector. So uh, we can see that there, there will be, there is already a lot of foreign investment coming in. There will be a lot of foreign investment that will come in for the infrastructure. And uh, just uh, a week ago, the budget that has been announced, government of India, the finance minister has set up a DFI, that is Development Finance Institution, for which 20,000 crores have been allocated, it is going to uh, be a lending portal for an amount of 5 lakh crores in the next three years. So that's, so DFI is going to uh, allocate almost 5 lakh crores to the infrastructure sector in the next three years. So these are the real numbers we're talking from uh, official stats and all of this is uh, concerning infrastructure sector. So, so this is where we are in terms of numbers. Now, uh, you have explained, so has uh, all the industry experts have explained what litigation finance is, how this can uh, help anyone who's in need of uh, third party financing for their litigation or uh, their arbitration, et cetera. Infrastructure sector, uh, as I said, from the figures, becomes one of the most important critical sectors of this dispute uh, resolution um, ecosystem, because you will see majority of disputes 
uh, almost 70-75% of disputes are in the infrastructure sector, whether it is energy, whether it is construction, uh, whether it is uh, the transport uh, ecosystem that government of India is planning to uh, uh, you know, upgrade in the next few years. World Bank is funding these projects. So infra is uh, facing a lot of disputes already. There will be a lot of disputes that will come to infra in the next couple of years. So there is no way we can ignore uh, infrastructure sector. Uh, in 2016, I have some figures, 9.2 billion US dollars were stuck in arbitrations in India, just of government of India's arbitrations against uh, contractors. So I, I'm sure the figures must have gone up since then. Uh, so if, if you're looking at 9.2 billion in 2016, stuck of government of India. So uh, I think for infrastructure, it is, it is a sector which is very capital intensive. There, there are very, uh, you know, um, fixed and high capital expenditures that are required. And it is not for these players to uh, invest a lot of money in their ongoing litigations and arbitrations, unless you are really the top players who buffer for these funds right from the beginning. But for all the medium uh, and, you know, um, uh, you know, 100, 200 crore turnover companies, it's not possible for them to go on uh, and litigate and arbitrate uh, with these uh, huge counterclaims and hu huge claims, uh, sometimes against the government, sometimes against uh, their subcontractors, because they require that capital continuously uh, to enable them to, uh, you know, process their work. So I think infrastructure's sector will greatly benefit if uh, we are able to streamline this litigation finance and arbitration finance from third parties in India in times to come. I think Sushank, you make a well, very valid point and I do see a lot of interested parties on the list of attendees who must be hearing you very keenly. And even you know, our experience has been the same that a lot of portfolio financing, especially uh, infra companies having number of disputes against several state-owned enterprises go back together to a funder where they can bring in large scale financing and working capital need met by using or, or, or monetizing their dispute assets. But that, that's the private sector, right? You know, we, we also have to look at the public sector themselves as users of litigation finance. And how do you think the public sector or the state-owned enterprise can benefit from litigation finance? Uh, Pratik, that's that's uh, a very, very important point that you've made. Uh, I think just like the private sector, public sector is in need of the assistance from these third party funders, uh, more so autonomous bodies, uh, you know, the public sector undertakings, I, I won't say government of India, but there's so many public sector undertakings which are almost autonomous. And uh, so they have a traditional way of working. All their claims, whether it is an arbitration or a litigation, uh, they have an internal audit system. So you would rarely see a PSU putting up a claim or a counterclaim unless it is able to justify it to their own auditors. Uh, this, from a funder's perspective, is in fact a, a very high-grade due diligence that most PSUs do internally, even before they approach a council or when, when they have approached a law firm, this due diligence has been done. Because uh, what happens is a year later or two years later, if they're not successful in, in, in getting that claim that they have made either in court or before the tribunal, their auditors are going to ask them that, uh, how do you justify these numbers? So everything that they put on paper, they have to first substantiate it internally. And uh, then these claims are processed. Now, coming back to the point how litigation finance is going to help the public sector undertakings is exactly identical to how it will help the private sector. Uh, the, there has been a constant worry in the minds of PSUs when we talk about getting them funded is because uh, as all of us know, traditionally it has not been done. Uh, there have been so many ifs and buts, which uh, time and again have been answered and they do not really have uh, any mechanism to get the correct answers. So I think ILF will, will be that catalyst, will be that organization which can, uh, you know, uh, allay all the fears and confusions and apprehensions that PSUs have 
when they look at uh, these um, uh, the third party uh, funding now the real challenge would be uh, again from their auditors especially on the fact that you know a funder would uh, look at uh, its share in in the ultimate outcome so that is a point where funders will have to look at psu slightly differently from public uh, from private sector uh, and may have, uh, you know, different scales of negotiation because um, it's, it's a huge market. It's a market that uh, uh, all the stakeholders must penetrate, must uh, lend support. But that would be on slightly different considerations given that it's a, it's a very traditional and conservative market dying to open up. So that is where we are. I think those are those are extremely useful points, and uh, you know, it reminds me of what just was spoken by uh, uh, Dilip some time back when he said, "Look, banks may need litigation finance, and banks may need management uh, and litigation recovery capability." And and as you said, PSU banks have a lot of recoverability which are pending, especially in the infrastructure sector, and and I, I do see. Uh, such banks and financial players uh, benefiting hugely from litigation finance, especially in cases of, of insolvency, uh, with so many companies under insolvency who are, you know, having claims, uh, receivable claims, especially in the infrastructure sector against the PS, uh, public sector again. So, you know, th th those are very useful points and it helps me ask Samir a question on, on, some, on some similar ground of how do you think the insolvency regime, which has now been touted for moving very quickly towards the international direction, how do you how do you see the insolvency regime can benefit from litigation finance? Well, thank you, Pratik, uh, for the question. Uh, I think insolvency in uh, bankruptcy is is something which is uh, really struggling to take shape in India, and and with the new codified law. Um, there is some level of structuring. However, uh, just like India as a country is uh, not, uh, you know, not been made um, uh, the center point of, of litigation finance, so, so is the insolvency in bankruptcy. However, um, every recovery is an asset for a liquidator on, or, or an insolvency practitioner. And uh, unfortunately, more often than not, it's seen that uh, what is realized a readily liquidate, liquidatable asset and not a dispute. So a lot of in, uh, you know, effort is not put in to um, seek to re seek and recover what is uh, rightly available. So of course, non-availability finance is one of the major factors. Um, I, I personally think that uh, a massive amount of benefit can be drawn to the companies in liquidation if if litigation finance was to be introduced um, for the companies in liquidation. However, having said that, the law as it stands today um, might, might create issues in terms of um, the funding agreement being recognized uh, as, as a valid agreement where you know, a certain amount of funds uh, outrightly go out to the funder in case of a win because of the law uh, mandating that you know, the funds which the company receives have to be distributed in a certain manner. Uh, while there are provision for interim finances uh, in, the, in the current law, however, I think some, some level of tweaking is required to, to make um, third-party funding for companies in insolvency and liquidation and um, to make it a more workable model for them. It certainly and most certainly will be uh, of uh, utmost benefit to the companies there. I think those, those are very useful points. And in fact, uh, I do appreciate that in, in insolvency, there is this uh, need to get clarity. Even today in insolvency, you may need to get permission under 60 bracket five to get an approval of, of the finance agreement. But, but I do see some inroad in the liquidation segment where in liquidation now, at least since November 2020, uh, the, the various amendments to the Insolvency Act permit you to uh, raise such finance. And I think uh, that's a useful development and it gives you a good direction to move in. But, but, but what do you think about uh, MSMEs and startups? You know, we are talking about these big infra companies, we're talking about these big markets, but 
are those the only beneficiaries of litigation finance or is as alan said access to justice for the startup community you know who are ip driven who are making technology sometimes losing it to the big corporates uh, you know are are those companies or, or even apps for example you know we've seen a lot of apps falling into trouble recently with various regulators in different markets do you think uh, uh, they are going to benefit from litigation finance well most certainly pratik i think the biggest beneficiaries of of uh, third party funding would be uh, the msme class or the startup class uh, you know um, there's increased uh, takeover of um, either the companies or these technologies being employed by uh, massive conglomerates and when disputes arise there is of course uh, no parity in terms of the uh, money power and the and the power of litigation um and um uh, we we saw this live couple of uh, uh, months back uh, there was a dispute where uh, this msme was up against one of the biggest conglomerate in fact uh, we did that with allen's fund and till such time uh, you know the the counterparty realized that there is no funder on board and it will be an expensive litigation uh, they were pushing hard and as soon as we were able to put forth um a message or a term sheet from a funder that you know there is a meritorious claim uh, there was an immediate settlement now uh, the important thing there is that as soon as a funder agrees to fund a dispute the 60% of the battle in terms of its merits uh, is is settled because uh, there is extensive due diligence before uh, a funder agrees to fund so uh, Uh, you're right and i think that msme sector and the access of justice issue certainly gets resolved as soon as uh, a fund uh, chooses to fund a litigation by uh, M- an uh, msme or a startup or or a company which certainly cannot put in that amount of money into the litigation at the very interesting point you make you 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 resonate what tom said in his uh the marks that you know you you send a message to the other side of uh you know the, the case is diligent it's good for its money the funders have tested it as a practitioner what would you do when you're on the receiving side when someone against you is funded would you recommend your client to pack up your bags and leave or would you still uh pursue the litigation and tell your client that look the funder doesn't know what he's doing you know we need to still go and chase uh chase everything we can that's both a good and a tricky question pradeek uh, and I, <laughs> you kind of put me at a spot there um it's it, i don't think there's a straight jacket answer to that and um while while I, we may face uh, someone uh, with a fund uh, and it's a funded claim and normally it will always be the claimant which will be funded unless and until the respondent has a counter claim um seeing that a that a dispute is funded certainly puts the respondent on a back foot uh, consciously uh, or rather subconsciously but uh, it's not always the scenario that you recommend settling uh, just because uh, a matter is funded um you know that brings me to a very important aspect as to what is the amount of disclosure which has been made to the funder uh, and you initially mentioned something called a guerrilla tactic and that those weapons are always available uh, to you as a party uh, when you are contesting a matter so uh, you need to see exactly how meritorious your defense is and if you think uh, you will be able to sustain it then why not just just litigate um, but but un- if it is certainly not that much of a meritorious defense and you're just defending because you have been sued then uh, of course settling is an option the good thing about arbitration is there is uh, no time when you can settle you can always settle and you can see how the case is going uh, post discovery you can always always make an offer for settlement but uh, it just certainly depends on a case to case basis right right no i think what what the take away from all this discussion is that litigation finance can actually create settlement atmosphere actually yes. resolve the dispute you know take it away from the promoter mindset generally to run the case till its very end or even a uh, uh, institutional company where there are personal egos involved i think what i take from this message is that litigation financiers bring that third party uh, objective view to the case which really lead to resolution of the dispute 
so so far we've heard from various perspectives you know we've heard from funders we've heard from practitioners we've heard from arbitral institutions themselves but i think one important perspective in india is always of the chartered accountant right they are involved through and through they are as pratik i think i think uh, you've missed i think sharan has also joined so uh, you were to ask ah, some questions sharan has there. joined i i i i didn't notice that thank you for for bringing that up i i went from sharan's message on my phone that he's still stuck in court but i'm 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 glad to see he's here. glad to see he's here hi sharan thanks sharan good to have hi, you hi hi pratik hi shashank hello everyone apologies for joining late but i have literally come from a court in a matter which could do with a lot of funding straight into this panel discussion <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's that's good to know, and uh, and I will straight put you on the spot. Then that, what do you think if that case which you think needs funding was funded, what would the judge think? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, Pratik. Because I think that whilst we talk about revolutionary ideas, at least in the Indian context, I know that it's gained currency in Western and other Eastern jurisdictions. I think that. Um, what the judge would think in the initial days of third party funding in india is to kind of uh, squint his eyes and to start with at least before the concept becomes well understood and well accepted which i know that this forum is trying to do i think that the initial reaction is going to be one i think suspicion is a strong word but the judge will be a little bit wary of a funded case that is really what the judge is going to think because um in india we do hold on to certain traditional notions and one of the traditional notions which at least i think that the judges have imbibed over here is that any form of contingency or finance or gain related to the outcome of the litigation to be received by somebody who is not himself or herself a party to the litigation is something that the courts are wary of because it converts litigation from a process by which you're asserting a right to a process by which you're carrying on a business and when litigation becomes business it requires a mindset change so that would be how i think judges are going to perceive uh, and when i say judges there are judges and then there are judges i mean i think that everyone on this panel will immediately start imagining which judge or which hypothetical judge are we talking about when you ask this question i mean i look at the judges that i appear before on a regular basis in a very important commercial jurisdiction like mumbai and i can think of some judges who would adapt to the idea of third party funding almost instantaneously and look at it only positively but then there are our, our judges and i think that the latter would constitute the majority at least till this concept becomes familiar for everyone who would perhaps start off with a wary approach to third party funding because they're going to view litigation as business and sometimes perhaps they feel that litigation is about really an assertion of rights even if those rights translate into money or monetary claims you're ultimately asserting a right that belongs only to you so that would be the initial response having said that having said that i think that the good thing is that there have been precursors in some ways to litigation funding or financing in india in other aspects of uh, legislation there is no direct legislation on third party funding but now there are some precursors which are not of course an equivalent of litigation funding but let me give you a simple example a very simple example when the sarfezi act was enacted in 2001 or 2002 what did you do by the sarfezi act you essentially took the entire process of enforcement of securities you took it outside the judiciary and allowed companies to enforce securities and realize value for security without reference to the judicial process it was challenged and although that's by no means litigation funding what it did recognize for the first time is that you can in cash your claim independent of the judicial process and then it is for the other side to go to the judiciary and complain when when acts and legislations like that were challenged for the first time the whole argument was how can you allow people to realize value for their claim without the judiciary first having given its blessings to your claim how can you allow assignment of securities 
realize value, pocket the value without any reference to the judiciary at all. That was in one sense, in a very small way, a precursor to third party funding. Because in third party funding also, what a plaintiff or a claimant is doing is that in a sense, he is realizing some value for his claim through a process of funding, even before the judiciary has accepted or rejected that claim. So we have seen advancements in legislation which have allowed realization for value, realization of value for rights without reference to a judicial process. And I think the third party funding will eventually in time get the same kind of recognition. I mean, as the uh, English courts, the Court of Appeal and Excalibur said, and that's a very instructive judgment, which I think at some point the Indian courts are going to look at. Whilst they may have commented adversely on the manner in which the third party funders operated in that case, or the law firms operated in that case, there is an interesting passage in Excalibur, which is an instruction guide to judges, that you cannot look at the concept of third party funding as anything which is immoral, immoral or reprehensible. On the other hand, the concept of third party funding must be welcome. Now, if India is going to keep lockstep with foreign jurisdictions when it comes to commercial laws, whether it's arbitration, whether it's enforcement of securities, whether it's the creation of commercial courts, I think that the Indian courts will ultimately have to be guided by foreign jurisdictions, even on matters relating to third party funding. And that is eventually going to change the mindset of judges. So to answer your question, the answer is initially, the majority of judges will be wary. But in time, they will come around and accept that this is really the way that litigation is going to move forward because even litigation in India is very contentious, very costly. And I may say this, that as a practitioner in India, um, it's basically a high stakes game in many ways between highly informant, informed stakeholders. And when you have informed stakeholders, it allows for the process of litigation funding to be then carried out in an even way everyone has access to it, due diligence, disclosures of agreements. So it's not as if anyone is going to be blindsided by the process when there are informed stakeholders. So I think over time, there will be acceptance. Initially, there will be resistance. Well, that's, a, that's a very well thought out answer. And I think uh, Excalibur is a, is a beautiful uh, uh, use point for Indian judiciary, especially as we discussed previously, India has its own heritage of 100 years of jurisprudence permitting and allowing litigation finance and then tying up with the modernity of Excalibur would, would bring in that confidence for the Indian judiciary. And I think IALF also will play that role of liaising with the right players and right members of the judiciary to, to enlighten them that this concept is really something which is going to, as Alan said, increase access to justice and help uh, the players in real need of capital. But, but as a counsel, Sharan, what would you recommend to your client? Uh, would you recommend your client to explore relegation finance? Um, you know, you know, Pratik, uh, I think that the question is, and the question is obviously broad. And I think I'd be answering in, in a, with a platitude to say it depends upon the circumstances. But with that caveat, that it obviously does depend upon the circumstances. I think that the answer to your question is that I would certainly be more inclined to it if it was an alternative dispute resolution mechanism like an arbitration, I would be perhaps a little bit more watchful and careful if I was going to do it in court. Because for some reason, the perception in India is that arbitration represents the new world, the modern world, where these ideas and notions are acceptable, readily acceptable. And if I may say so, I would think that even in ad hoc arbitrations in India, I don't expect that anyone is going to judge you or be judgmental of you just because your claim is being funded by a third party. When it comes to court, it really does go back to whether I feel confident at that moment in time that you're not putting yourself at a disadvantage with the judge or with the judiciary in the perception that this is all very mercenary and nobody is actually interested in the litigation or the, the proclamation of right, so to speak, right and wrong. I may also say one more, one more aspect to my answer is that sometimes the contest in India, as I think all over the world, is going to be uneven to start with because the staying power, the paying power, the deep pockets, there are huge variations in fortunes of the litigants in a given case. 
And sometimes I may say that even if I'm wary of the judiciary, if there is a tremendous mismatch between the claimant or plaintiff on the one hand and a deep pocket defendant on the other hand, I would say, forget about your worries about how it's going to be perceived. If this is something which is legitimized in India, it is properly regulated and does not fall foul of the law. If you're legal, forget about perceptions of how you're going to be uh, perceived in the moral sense, in the sense of right and wrong. For the purposes of that litigation, uh, 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 I would say all things considered, if this is required to remain in the game, then go for it, even if you have to be watchful. So it's a, it's a facts and circumstances kind of answer, but more readily for arbitrations, less so for court litigation, at least to start with, unless absolutely necessary to stay in the game. I think those words of caution are very useful from Sharan, and I think it it very nicely concludes the perspectives, the various perspectives we have. And I think that the judiciary's perspective is very important. And, and uh, with a counsel like Sharan, who spends most of his time in front of the judiciary, I think it's a good takeaway for funders of how, how the market, in, in domestic market in India, and the, and the courts and judiciary would perceive litigation finance moving away from the arbitration circuit.